G'day guys and welcome to Chewing the Fat. I am CB. Unfortunately, JY, my co-host, has fallen ill today and he will not be joining us, but um, he does send his apology to the Chewing the Fat family and he is very, very disappointed to miss out on this chat, which I'm very excited about. We are grateful to have Shari Reeves, the celiac dietitian, with us to chew the fat today about all things celiac disease, gluten-free diet, um, who she is and what she does. So welcome, Shari. Thanks so much for joining us. How are you going today? Hi, Chris. Good. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, I'm really good. I'm excited to be, yeah, speaking about celiac disease, my little passion. It's become the last, yeah, year or so. So excited to be here. Awesome. It is uh, such a cool sort of niche area that's sort of been, um, you know, popularised a hell of a lot more um, in the modern medical world of recent times. So it's really cool to have you on the show. It's such a cool niche area that you're working with and the people that you work with, I'm sure, are very, very grateful to have someone like you in their lives. So can we start by just telling us a little, a little bit about yourself, Shari, and, and what exactly it is that you do? Yeah, so... Um Basically, I never envisioned myself becoming a dietitian. Um, so long story short, I have gone through a health issue myself. Um, and that was at the young age of 21. So that really gave me um, a want to help, you know, other people who have chronic conditions too. Um, so at the age of 24, I went back to uni. I got into the combined degree of uh, Bachelor of Health Sciences and Masters in Dietetic Practice. So I graduated from that mid-2019. Um, I didn't really want to work in a hospital environment. I don't really like the vibe of hospitals personally, myself. Um, and then I thought, oh, community dietetics. But then I thought, I want to work for myself. <laughs> um, so last year, I actually took the, yeah, plunge and went out on my own and set up my um, Instagram account. And the reason I wanted to specialise in celiac disease is actually because my um, partner's mum, she was diagnosed in 2019 with celiac disease herself. Uh, she had suffered for 40 plus years of celiac disease and never had, yeah, a formal diagnosis until, yeah, two years ago. So... Yeah, it's uh, it's a very long time to suffer, isn't it? And I'm guessing that's a, a pretty common story that you see that this is something that goes undiagnosed for for long periods of time, which uh, which must be very frustrating. So we're going to get into that, but I mean to to start off the bat, Shari, what I want to know is what exactly is celiac disease? Um, how do you get it, and and how is it diagnosed? Yeah, so great question. Um. When people are diagnosed, it's quite often that they're not actually told what celiac disease even is, um, surprisingly. So celiac disease, it's an immune disease and it's triggered by the consumption of gluten. So gluten is a protein that's found in wheat, rye, barley and controversially oats. So when someone with celiac disease ingests gluten or consumes it, there's actually an inappropriate or abnormal immune reaction to the gluten in the gut. So it causes inflammation and damage to the lining of the small intestine. Now, the reason this is so crucial and critical is because the small um, intestine, the lining, is where we absorb all of our nutrients. So all of our minerals and vitamins and all of that. So you can imagine if it's inflamed and damaged, we aren't absorbing, you know, the nutrients that we need to be absorbing to help our body function, you know, to the optimal conditions. So it can lead to a lot of issues within the body, um, both short term and long term. Um, so how do you get it? So it's actually a genetic component. So 99.6% of people who have celiac disease have one or both of the genetic um, markers. It's HLA-DQ2 and HLA-DQ8. Um, so like I said, 99.6% of people have these markers. Surprisingly, 30% of the population actually have these markers. In saying that, only about 3% of people will go on to diagnose celiac disease or to um, develop celiac disease, sorry. Um, 
And then, so that's the genetic component. Then you need the environmental component. So you must be ingesting gluten for it to develop. So that allows the body to have the immune response. Um, and the environmental factors about what sets it off or what, you know, triggers it, it's not 100% understood. Um, there is talk about things such as a GI infection, so a gut infection, potentially viral infections, severe stress, um, and surgery is something else that they think, yeah, can, can trigger that immune response when gluten is in, yeah, the gut. Right, okay. And then, okay. So yeah. it's not something that you can catch, essentially. It's something that you need to be yeah. genetically predisposed to, to have. Correct. Yes, that's the yeah, that's the word. Genetically predisposed people, yeah, okay. will develop it. Um, and yeah, diagnosis. Obviously, it's something that, like you just spoke about with that example with with your mother in law, that yeah, it can often go undiagnosed for for long periods of times. Why is that the case? And then how is it diagnosed from there? Yeah. So a lot of people like it's I guess trial and error. So. Um, trying to figure out what food component is setting off the gut issues. So usually it's, it's the constant bloating, the pain, uh, diarrhea, constipation, those kinds of symptoms that, you know, alert people to potentially there's something wrong in the gut, but they don't necessarily know why. Um, so it can take a while, I guess, clients to go to a, a doctor and have the doctor believe them and really take them seriously and be like it's not just in their head it's actually an issue um, so there's yeah issues with I guess GPs to an extent um, and then people yeah it might be um, what word am I trying to think of like uh, I guess, clueless to what type of food is setting off um, the issues in their gut. In saying that, a lot of people, they do know that it's wheat that's setting them off. Um, so, yeah, there's a, there's a few reasons why it can go um, undiagnosed. And, that, like, people just put up with the symptoms. Oh, I don't know what's wrong with me. I don't know. I just won't eat wheat. You know, it seems to be wheat. I just won't eat it. Um, yeah. And then, um, so you asked about how it's diagnosed. Was yeah. that the next? Yep. Um, so essentially there's three steps to diagnosing it. So they need to be eating gluten is the first main one. So if you've taken gluten out of your diet, the blood test for the antibodies, it will come up negative. So if someone has taken gluten out of their diet, they'll need to undergo a gluten challenge. So this involves eating about two, four slices of bread, wheat bread a day for about four weeks. Um, once that's undergone, they can go and get the antibody test. In saying that, a lot of people who've taken wheat out of their diet because they know that it's impacting them are so resistant and hesitant to undergo the gluten challenge. Yeah, which is un yeah, which it's totally understandable. They're in pain, you know, they're bloated, going to the toilet. It it becomes a very mentally draining um, condition when it's yeah not treated. So um, in that circumstance there is the genetic test that can be done to check for the one of the, or both of the two genetic markers. Um, so instead of doing the gluten challenge, you can get the genetic test. And then if the genetic tests come back negative, well then you more than likely do not have it. It's like a small, like 0.4% chance um, that you have it. Um, if you do come back with the marker, then kind of need to work with the clients and explain to them why it's important that they do the gluten challenge in order to then have the antibody tests. And then if that's positive, the antibody tests, blood tests, they will need to go and get a scope. So they'll go down and they'll take some biopsies from the small intestine. 
Um, and that is the gold standard marker for diagnosing celiac disease. Right. Because you can see the damage um, in the lining through, yeah, like the, the cells and, yeah, what they take. I can certainly see the reluctance and hesitation to someone who has already got the knowledge that they're obviously not tolerating wheat or gluten in their diet. And then you're telling them that they, oh, they need to go away and eat that for four weeks to be sure of the diagnosis. Like it must be a massive like pushback in, in people getting told to do that challenge. Like that's, yeah, you know, that sounds awful. It does. It does. And it's funny. Um, so I work part time as well. When my partner's really busy, I work um, for him on the tools. And I was just casually chatting to this lady whose house I was at um, doing like my job there. And we spoke, of, we ended up getting onto the topic naturally. Um, and she's like, yeah, my mum has celiac disease. Um, I'm pretty sure I have it, but I'm not doing the gluten challenge. Like I'm not doing it. Like she full just, yeah, nah. And it's so common with so many people that I speak to, um, they just don't want to do it. And how important is it though, like for that, for that, that particular lady, for, as a perfect example, for her to actually do the challenge and get that proper diagnosis, like is that vitally important? Or if they're pretty sure they've got this already, can they just therefore, you know, not eat gluten forever and it's okay without getting that label? So the way I see it is, um, having a diagnosis of a chronic health condition is really important in terms of follow-ups and long-term management and monitoring. Um, so when someone is diagnosed with celiac disease, you know, a yearly um, blood test is so important. Just like something basic to check your nutrient levels, you know, to make sure you, you're not low in every, anything, you're not deficient, to make sure your body's working properly. But also one of the long-term effects, for example, of celiac disease is osteoporosis. So when you are diagnosed with celiac disease, you will then, well, you should be, doesn't always happen, um, you know, monitored via a DEXA scan, which measures bone mineral density. Um, so that is really important because it will show, you know, if you're likely to develop osteoporosis. And then in terms of that, you know, things can be, you know, precautions can be taken and, you know, you can go on particular medications to help, you know, with your bones and your calcium and taking supplements, making sure you're getting enough calcium in your diet. Um, so for things like, you know, long-term consequences I think it's really important and at the end of the day as painful as it is um, celiac disease is not an allergy you're not going to die from doing a gluten challenge I know that sounds really harsh and you know like you're not going to die yes you are going to be very mentally drained in pain uncomfortable you know um, but there's also other ways that we can manage your discomfort during that time as well. Um, yeah. So that's my view and opinion on it. Um, just in terms of long-term consequences, managing, you know, chronic health conditions is so important. Yeah, I, um, I would imagine as well, you know, you said initially that people would go to GPs and, you know, they're either not well educated on celiac disease or they don't send them for the right tests or they might not take it seriously, for example, in some cases, which is probably pretty, pretty frustrating, pretty sad to hear. But I imagine if you do go through that challenge and, and do get that label and that diagnosis, then it, it probably allows the whole management plan and the whole healthcare system to take you a little bit more seriously so you can get the proper care. Is that fair to say? A hundred percent. You know, a lot of the times, people who have been diagnosed with celiac disease still feel like some of their signs and symptoms aren't taken seriously, even though there is that diagnosis. So you can imagine if there isn't a diagnosis, you know, how much more, uh, it's just in your head, you know, uh, it's like, it's IBS, you know, you might just be stressed or it's, you know, other foods or, you know, that kind of thing. So it can be really frustrating. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, and something I'm really curious about. So my lovely partner, Ali, is actually intolerant to gluten. Now she's 
been through all the tests and has been told that she does not have celiac disease, but at the same time, like literally cannot tolerate eating any sort of gluten at all. So what's the difference between people who are, well, I suppose, just intolerant to gluten, but are not actually celiacs? Yeah, so there's, I look at it as there's three main components to um, the difference between the two. So first of all, intolerance, there's no physical damage to the small intestine. Yeah. So you're not, you know, malabsorbing nutrients. You aren't having inflammation and damage that's impacting other, you know, parts of your body, other organ systems. Um, because celiac disease, I don't know if I explained it um, earlier, it actually impacts so many organ systems of the body, not just the gut. Mm -hmm. um, whereas gluten intolerance, you know, you have the same, you know, symptoms, GI, gut symptoms, you know, it's very similar, if not the same as celiac disease. Um, there's just no physical damage. Um, the other thing is, like you said, she went under, like she underwent all those tests to make sure it wasn't celiac disease. So gluten intolerance can only be diagnosed once other um, diseases are ruled out. So things like celiac disease, um, inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease, uh, and th like bowel cancer, those kinds of things. And then the third um, component that I look at the difference is when you're gluten intolerant, you do not need to follow a strict gluten-free diet um, because there is no damage occurring. So in saying that, most people who are intolerant do not want one bit of gluten, as you would probably know, yes. because you're still getting the same sign, you know, the gut signs and symptoms, and they're not pleasant, they're not fun. Um, so most people will still follow a strict gluten-free diet. However, it is not detrimental, um, yeah, to intolerance. Interesting. I, I'd be keen to hear your thoughts and, and if we can go into detail about both the short-term and long-term implications of gluten intolerance as well as celiac disease, because like you said, there's probably so many people that have lived with, you know, all these sort of symptoms and they probably think, oh, this is normal, this is common. And, you know, before being educated or before potentially listening to something like this, they probably wouldn't recognise that maybe they've got an intolerance or maybe they've got a disease. Um, so what are those short-term yeah, I mean, symptoms and, and issues that arise from being intolerant or, or being a celiac. And then what are the long-term implications from there as well that I suppose are specific to, to that diagnosis of celiac disease? Yeah, so I guess the short-term implications more so are around the gut symptoms. So the pain, the bloating, the discomfort, um, you know, diarrhea, constipation. And then the long-term implications include, like I mentioned, um, osteoporosis. So when you're not absorbing nutrients, you aren't absorbing calcium, which um, calcium deficiency in the long-term leads to osteoporosis. Um, low iron, so again, you won't be absorbing you know, much iron. That can lead to iron deficiency anemia in the long-term. Um, and then I guess, like to the side of iron deficiency anemia, um, when you don't have, you know, the energy, it helps, you know, with energy. So you're going to have poor concentration. A lot of um, people who have celiac complain of brain fog. Um, so they're really cloudy. They can't think properly. And they just think it's a normal way of, you know, life. That's just like how it is. However, once they introduce a gluten-free diet, um, the brain fog goes away. So they're absorbing the nutrients again. And, you know, that's allowing, you know, all the energy to go through your body. Um, so yeah, there's iron deficiency anemia. Um, another one is that people do not always associate with celiac disease is something like infertility. Um, so women may have no idea they have celiac disease, and then for whatever reason, they aren't conceiving, they're having issues, they go and see their GP and then the GP will, you know, like they should um, mark, you know, and say, all right, let's test for celiac disease because undiagnosed, untreated celiac disease for 
um, reasons still not fully understood leads to infertility. And then once, yeah, the gluten-free diet's introduced, you know, they become pregnant. Um, so... that around, Shari, you know, if, you, if you're having fertility issues and then you do manage a celiac disease that maybe was undiagnosed and you go on a gluten-free diet, that's something that can change. It's not something that, you, you know, you're stuck with. Yes, as far as, yeah, I understand. Um, and a lot of the um, infertility dietitians as well um, that I follow on Instagram and that uh, they, yeah, kind of discuss gluten as well and like testing for celiac disease. And then, yeah, that kind of, yeah, should, yeah, usually help once a gluten-free diet is commenced, yeah. Yeah, well, that's something that's so important for, for many women to know about, isn't it, you know? Um, oh, that can be a, a horrible, emotional, frustrating time if you, you know, you're trying to start a family and you're struggling to conceive and you don't have the answers and you may be dealing with, you know, a doctor or a GP who doesn't have experience in this area and, you know, it just leads to that frustration and that ongoing issue where you don't have answers when there may be one right in front of you, eh? Um, 100%, yeah. yeah I mean, which probably leads me, so once you do get this diagnosis which which hopefully you know we can spread awareness about this disease we can spread awareness about gluten intolerances and people can be more you know sort of mindful and open to to looking into this part of, of their physical health um once you get a diagnosis where does someone go from there you know do they go to a gp for management do they should they be going straight to a dietitian is there other professionals who are the go-to people for celiacs i mean what's the first step okay <laughs> Well, hopefully, the reason I laugh is you'll, um, yeah, I'll tell you in a minute. GPs are essential in obviously diagnosing, um, running the tests, you know, getting all that stuff underway. Then they will, if someone comes back with positive bloods, they'll refer them to a gastroenterologist who does the scope and the biopsy. The results will come back and then it can go one of two ways. <laughs> They can be an amazing or good GP and say, yep, you have celiac disease, you need to see a dietitian. Or they can just say, yep, you have celiac disease, eat gluten-free, bye. Um, and you would have no idea how many clients I've had that that's happened to. Um, it, yeah, it blows my mind. Um, I guess in terms of celiac disease, the only treatment at the moment is a strict gluten-free diet. Like that's the only way that you can, you know, successfully manage it. Um, and the amount of GPs who don't refer patients on to dietitians is quite big. Um, and, the, you know, the way that we help is obviously we're nutrition experts. We are trained in medical nutrition therapy so medical nutrition therapy is basically a way that we help to manage chronic disease via diet and nutrition. Um, so when it comes to celiac disease, we are one of the key, if not the key, you know, expert in terms of managing it because we teach clients how to label read, you know, how to see if there's gluten, you know, in the product, on the label, we teach them suitable swaps. So, you know, going from wheat-based foods to gluten-free foods, there can be a nutrition, nutrition gap um, where there's less nutrients, you know, in gluten-free products. So we can help give them substitutes that are gonna keep, you know, their nutrient levels up so they're not losing as much. Um, yeah, so label reading, um, ensuring nutritional adequacy, um, and then correcting any nutrient deficiencies by a diet as well. Um, so we kind of are the key, you know, um, a key component. And then also depending on the long-term effects, um, a lot of my clients have neurologists as well because you, um, it's, yeah, a common thing where there's neurolog neurological conditions um, which are usually due to nutrient deficiencies. So people can get numbness and tingling, um, things like epilepsy. Um, yeah, early onset dementia as well is another thing that's been linked. Um, 
So neurologists, yeah, um, gastroenterologists, dietitians, and also psychologists as well. Um, so there was a study done and the impact of maintaining and managing a strict gluten-free diet, um, this study found that it's almost, it is equivalent to having uh, end-stage renal disease and being on dialysis. So that's the mental, um, you know, uh, what word am I trying to think of? Like um, uh, implications, you know, of having, sure. sorry. It's like a toll, it's a burden on you all the time. Yes, so that's the yeah, massive mental burden. Um, you know, when you think about it, we don't think if... I don't have celiac disease, you don't have celiac disease, you know, we can eat whatever we want, when we want, where we want. You would know um, with your partner, um, you know, even just being intolerant to gluten, like she doesn't want to risk getting, you know, stomach, you know, issues and that. And it becomes, it's every, we eat to stay alive, breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks in between. Imagine thinking about that every single day, you know, what am I going to eat for this meal? Oh my God, I've got an event on the weekend. Oh, are there going to be gluten-free options? You know, there's so many, um, yeah, areas that you need to think about, you know, and you can't be as spontaneous as you once used to be. So it's a whole massive lifestyle change. So psychologists are another key, key um, health professional and who I've, often said to clients, you know, have you seen a psychologist? They really, they can be so beneficial yeah. to help with the mental health side of things. It's really interesting you said that. And just going back to the, the point on GPs as well, um, that, you know, and I know you, you sort of sound reluctant to probably pump up your own tyres and the role dietitians play, but obviously dietitians are the key in managing people with celiac disease. So let's not be shy okay. in, uh, in saying that. Um, and, you know, back to the whole GP thing, you know, GPs are excellent wonderful people that are so important and they need to be so knowledgeable and so school, skillful in so many different areas you know to keep people healthy and to literally keep people alive that the best gps they're just that they're general practitioners and they know when they need to refer off to people who are experts in certain fields such as dietitians in celiac disease such as physiotherapists in musculoskeletal issues such as lots of other different specialists for lots of other different conditions and the best gps will refer out to the most appropriate people um so yeah hopefully we can continue to spread awareness and that can happen um more and more but i did really i'm really interested in in the fact that you said you know psychologists should play a massive role because it's something i see all the time physical health concerns have a massive impact on our mental health and, and people i still think that's underappreciated it's something we've touched on quite a bit on, on chewing the fat um, both in season one and season two is the implications on physical health issues on our mental health so i think that's such an important topic that um, you know, we do understand that the stress and the burden and, um, you know, just the inconvenience that comes with having to, you know, take on a gluten-free diet and lifestyle forever, essentially, you know, it's not for a week or a month. Um, that's, you know, it's hugely stressful. It's hugely inconvenient. And, and, you know, the social implications and eating out and all that sort of stuff and the difficulties we have is something we're going to touch on. Um, but yeah, I think that's such a, an interesting point. Yeah, definitely. Um, and in saying that, I have um, my uh, celiac mentor, um, a dietitian mentor, her name is Kim, um, Kim Faulkner Hogg. And I really gel, you know, well with her and love learning from her because she is so big on the mental health side of celiac disease as well. Um, and the way that she educates her clients is very, you know, mental health based. And um, yeah, I just, yeah, really look up to her because, you know, I, I have a chronic health condition and I know how it is to be impacted, you know, daily by it, daily medication, which is really nothing. Like I don't have to think about what I eat and stuff, um, you know, and that can take a toll, like you said, um, so, yeah, it is a really, really important aspect yeah, of celiac disease, which I'm all for advocating about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, an interesting topic that, that, that JY, my co-host, who's unfortunately not with us today, um, really wanted to chat to you about was 
there's, there's become, I think, um, a bit of a stigma around celiac disease and, and eating gluten-free to the point where it's almost become a fad. You know, it's, it has become popularised, which is a good thing. But I think there are, you know, you know, probably not correctly, but there's a certain, you know, a small percentage of people in society that say, oh, celiac disease, like, is that even a thing? Like, why are you eating gluten-free? Like, are you just trying to be healthy? Are you just trying to be a hippie? Like, it's become a fad and a bit of a stigma. There's a bit of a judgy sort of thing around it, which it shouldn't be because it's a real thing. Um, is that something that you sort of see and deal with and, and can appreciate? And, and yeah, what's what's your thoughts on on that sort of stigma almost that's, that has come about to some extent? Yeah, so it makes it, you know, really hard for those who genuinely, you know, have celiac disease and, and they need to go out and, you know, they feel like a burden, you know, because some waiters are just like, oh, like, you know, I've heard stories of, you know, people going out and they're genuinely, they like, have celiac disease and the waiter kind of just like brushes them off and, you know, again, there's the mental, you know, mental health, you know, implications that they feel like a burden to other people. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think, I don't really know where the stigma come from per se, um, I don't know if it's just been labelled as like another trend or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's definitely not ideal for those who actually have celiac disease, you know, and they're constantly feeling like, you know, they have to explain themselves when they go out and, you know, it just, yeah, adds another, I guess, yucky aspect to it for them. Which I mean, which is why I think you know I was so excited to have you on today because I think having more of these conversations is going to spread more awareness and get people to take it more seriously and realise that you know someone isn't going to go into a restaurant and say, oh, do you have any gluten free options or can you make sure this is gluten free because it's cool or it's because of fat or because they want to be difficult. They're doing it because one, they want to avoid pretty significant short term symptoms, you know, bloating and diarrhea and gastrointestinal issues and all these horrible things that no one wants. And two, they want to avoid long term complications. They want to avoid, you know, osteoporosis or infertility or, you know, all those other things that you mentioned, you know, and it has to be taken more seriously. And I think, you know, these conversations are uh, the only way that, you know, hopefully we can get people to take it more seriously and not see it as, yeah, a stigma or, or inconvenience when you're getting asked about it at a restaurant or in social situations. Um, yeah. yeah, so which probably leads me to my next point. Um, eating out can be very, very difficult for, for celiacs, as I, uh, I'm sure you can appreciate. It's something that, um, yeah, I've learned a few things, um, yeah, living and being with someone for the last couple of years who's intolerant to gluten is that every time that I'm at a restaurant or a cafe, the first thing I do is scan the menu and see is there gluten free options? Is there a little GF in bracket? Can you know this, this place, uh, you know take us you know can this can this place um provide a suitable meal for for my partner to make sure that you know she can enjoy herself and um you know and not end up going home with some horrendous symptoms so when eating out you know when going out to, to places that may not necessarily always have the awareness or gluten-free options i mean do you have any advice how to how to celiacs go about you know eating out and you know getting other people to prepare their prepare their food yeah so um Something that we encourage is to firstly, like, have a look online. You know, most restaurants now, um, as you would know, have their menus online. So, you know, you can check out if there's gluten-free options available. Um, the other important thing in terms of eating out is we need to alert those, our patients or clients who have celiac disease all the different names for wheat. There are so many different um, types of wheat. Um, so one thing is like spelt, you know, um, and then oh, what was um, some, another type of barley um, was actually on a menu. Um, my mentor, um, Kim actually saw it on a menu, you know, and it was labeled gluten-free. Mm. Um, so even if you have celiac disease and you, you aren't always necessarily aware of all the different types of wheats and, you know, you, what their names are, um, it's so important just to double check all the ingredients that is um, listed in a food labelled gluten-free on the menu. Um, so once you've, you know, maybe found a suitable option on a menu, then go ahead and call the restaurant. Um, always recommend just because 
you want to know what are their cross contamination um, procedures in place to prevent that. So calling up, you know, if there's a gluten free pasta, asking something simple as do you cook the gluten free pasta in a separate pot or the same pot as wheat containing pasta? Um, you know, making sure that the, yeah, the two pasta waters are separate. Um, do you have a bench, you know, that's dedicated to preparing gluten-free food um, just to make sure there's no cross-contamination? Um, so calling ahead and asking certain questions like that. Um, and then I guess another place that people can get caught out, um, which is important to know, is like things like wedges and like grilled fish, you know, sometimes they can have a coating of flour just to give them a bit of, you know, make them crispy. Um, that will contain wheat, you know. So asking, do you use gluten-free, you know, flour if you have wedges? You know, what, what is the flour on them that makes them, you know, crispy or on your fish? Um, and I guess a, another important um, aspect is something called glute guard. Um, so this is actually a product that's available and it's developed um, in Australia um, and it actually is an enzyme and it helps to, in like lay terms, I guess mop up any residue gluten or potential um, cross-contamination gluten. Um, so that's always another option if someone's really stressed, you know, really anxious about eating out even after they've looked online, they've called, you know, it just, it's something that can give a little bit of um, extra reassurance that, you know, you, you've taken these tablets, it's going to help, you know, mop up, digest any potential contaminated gluten in your meal. Um, and yeah, you should, yeah, be fine. It's been, yeah, found to be really effective. So that's another little backup for eating out, for eating at friends' houses and for travelling as well when you cannot be 100% sure because there always is, you know, a tiny risk that you may be cross-contaminated. That's really interesting. So it's literally a tablet you would take just before you would potentially be at risk of ingesting a small amount of gluten that can minimise the symptoms if and when that does. So obviously it doesn't, you know, it's not going to stop you from eating a big bowl of pasta that's got gluten in it, but if there is cross-contamination or something small, it's going to be enough to nullify the effects. Yes. So, and yeah, you made like a really key point there. It is no, in no means like a treatment. Um, it is basically only to be used when you're eating out. Yeah. Like I said, traveling at someone else's house and you, you just want to be extra cautious. You can't be a hundred percent. Um, yeah, it can, yeah, help with the um, effects of any cross-contamination. Yeah. That's really interesting. It's something I hadn't heard of. Um, I might get some more info from you after the show and uh, we'll, yeah. we'll make a link up, link up in the show notes. Um, I think that's something that, yeah, people would be really, really, really interested in. Um, and yeah, I suppose it's it's so true, like you've spoken about, there's so many different kinds of wheats and, and foods that contain gluten. And it's, you know, even, you know, it's scary to think even something that can be labelled gluten-free can, in fact, actually contain gluten. And the people that are labelling that don't necessarily know. And if there's something I've learned, yeah, from the last couple of years is that there's so many bloody foods that have gluten in them. <laughs> um, yeah. Which, as I said, you know, it's that mental toll. It's that, it's that inconvenience of, you know, always having to go out of your way. Um, yeah, to avoid these things because it's just everywhere. It is just everywhere, isn't it? Um, so, I mean, eating out, it's tough. At home, um, I suppose it is a bit more of a controlled environment, but um, what tips have you got for, for celiacs or people on a gluten-free diet when eating at home and preparing their own food? Yeah, so um, I guess if you're living with someone else who is able to eat gluten-containing foods, um, having different shelves in your pantry you know, um, a gluten containing shelf and a non gluten containing shelf, labeling um, things such as margarine and spreads. Um, if you want your own, you know, label it, um, for example, um, Ali's margarine, don't touch, you know, gluten free. Um, so, labeling things, color coordinating things as well, um, it's just so it's easy, you go in just say there's like a little red container in the fridge that's got your margarine, you know, your spreads, 
you know, make it red, for example, pull that out, you know, it's safe. That's the gluten um, free, you know, little, little shelf. Um, also like in terms of washing your pots and pans, um, just thoroughly washing them with hot water and soap is enough. Um, you don't necessarily need different chopping boards, different pots and pans. Um, just ensuring it's always clean, well washed is fine. Um, same thing as like sandwich um, presses or toasters. Um, this can be a bit controversial because some people are like strictly no, sep you need separate toasters. Oh. Um, yeah, you can actually pop the toast in as long as there's no big visible crumbs or anything and it's clean, um, it can be okay to use. In terms of like sandwich presses, if you feel more comfortable, a tip is you can pop the sandwich inside like baking paper, um, pop that in like the sandwich press. Um, not like I said about restaurants, using different, if you're using um, gluten-free pasta and gluten containing pasta, uh, cooking the gluten-free pasta first and then using like a different strainer for that. And then, yeah, cooking the wheat pasta. Um, yeah, simple things like that make, will, yeah, make it safe, you know, re reduce the cross-contamination. And at home, because it is such, like you said, a more controlled like environment, it's a lot easier um, to reduce the risk of cross-contamination just with simple little steps mm. like that. Yeah. Something I can definitely relate to. I know in our house we've got, you know, we've got our separate breads and our separate butters and, um, you know, separate yeah. passes and all our separate foods all around the house. Um, but if there's something else that I have learned um, over the last couple of years, which probably a lot of celiacs don't want to hear, but in my um, humble opinion, gluten is bloody delicious. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I've tried um, a hell of a lot of gluten-free products and the vast majority of them, um, I hate to say it, just don't match up to their, you know, normal gluten um, alternative. <laughs> so I suppose when you do come across a gluten-free food that, you know, is very close to, to the normal, for lack of a better term, and that's really, really yummy, um, you know, you stick to that and we can be very loyal to those sort of brands. Do you have, you know, your favourite products? What are the best, you know, gluten-free variations for, for different foods out there that, um, yeah, that you could recommend to people? Yeah. Um, so in terms of brands, I um, really like, they're called Freedom Foods. So um, they produce a lot of cereals. They have like popcorn and things like that. And they use to replace the wheat um, in their products. They use like buckwheat and quinoa. So their foods are quite high in protein and fiber, which is great because protein and fiber are often stripped, you know, um, from gluten, like out of uh, wheat in order to make the gluten-free foods. Um, so I love Freedom Foods. Um, there's also another brand uh, called Simply Wise. And they actually do a lot of um, like, you know, pastries, like if you're going to someone's house, for example, and you want to take some spring rolls, you know, they've got their gluten-free spring rolls, their samosas, you know, those kinds of foods. I can vouch, um, can vouch for them. Uh, simply wise. Yeah, I can vouch there. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah, they are good. Um, <laughs> And then in terms of um, gluten-free foods that are not packaged, so when I'm looking at gluten-free foods, I kind of put them into two categories. So the packaged processed ones, these ones awfully, often are quite reduced, like I said, in protein, in fibre, in other nutrients like B vitamins. Um, and then there's you know, your whole, whole foods that are unprocessed, you know, unpackaged. So things like vegetables, they're gluten-free. Fruits, gluten-free. Um, you've got legumes and lentils, they're gluten-free. So you've got nuts and seeds, you know, you've got all these really rich nutrient dense foods that are naturally gluten-free. So I, I love promoting people to eat them just to keep up you know, their whole foods um, intake just because they are, yeah. 
you're up, Shari. These are foods that, I mean, most of us should be eating pretty regularly anyway, right? A hundred percent, yeah. So um, these foods fall into the five um, food groups uh, as uh, according to the Australian Dietary Guidelines. So the five food groups, um, you've got vegetables, fruits, you've got your grains, which is where most of the, the wheat and gluten is contained. And then you've got obviously like your meats and alternatives, your dairy and alternatives. All five food, well, minus grains, um, the other four food groups naturally in their natural state don't contain gluten. Um, and yeah, like you said, generally the population, we should be eating more of these groups. Even in the grains food group, you have so many gluten-free grains like, you know, buckwheat, quinoa, um, you know, you've got millet, you've got all these other, you know, um, substitutions that you can have that still provide you with nutrients and fiber and protein as well. So yeah, I like to look at good gluten-free foods um, more in the natural form as opposed to the processed form. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah. So for people who aren't the actual aren't intolerant to gluten, is there any benefits in eating gluten-free if you don't necessarily need to? Are gluten-free foods in general healthier than gluten-containing foods? Yeah, so um, running off the back of what I just said, that's um, a really good question. So um, in terms of the processed packaged foods, um, unless they've been fortified, which not a lot of gluten-free products are, um, they're very nutrient poor, but they can often be quite energy dense. So you're getting a lot of you know, energy, but not a lot of nutrition out of it. Um, as opposed to the natural natural ones. Um, so eating gluten-free for someone who doesn't have an intolerance or have celiac disease, I don't generally recommend. Um, if you can eat gluten, um, eat it. It's not causing you any damage. You know, you don't have celiac disease. You're not going to get the, the gut symptoms unless you feel personally like gluten is impacting you in some way then there's, yeah, I say eat foods containing gluten um, because if you're choosing gluten-free like white pasta, it's basically just starch. It's basically just carbohydrates with no other nutrition in it. Um, so it's not the best option. You know, you could be eating whole wheat pasta that has a whole heap of, you know, other nutrition in it, fibre, protein, B vitamins, that kind of stuff. Sure. Okay, cool. And in the situation, like obviously, you know, celiacs, you're going to try your best to prepare your foods with that gluten and eat out with that gluten. And, you know, in a situation where there is cross-contamination or you accidentally eat something that does contain gluten when you have an intolerance or you're a celiac, and you obviously know about it pretty quickly, what do you do then? You know, what's, what's the next step? I've accidentally eaten gluten. I didn't plan on doing it. What do I do now? Yeah, so this is a common thing and it happens. Um, it can happen, you know, quite often. And those who have celiac disease refer to it as I've been glutened. That's, you know, the, the general terminology they use. Um, and the first thing I say is don't panic. <laughs> you know, a lot of the times they panic and, oh my God, my stomach lining, you know, it's, it's damaged, you know, straight off the bat. And it's like, not necessarily um, as like, you know, <laughs> Um, comparing it to the gluten challenge, you need that prolonged consistent exposure to damage your small intestine from gluten. So a once off, it's really not going to damage your gut, um, your small intestine. In saying that, you will have symptoms, you will be uncomfortable, you know, you'll be in pain, you'll have those gut issues. Um, if you have any pains, you know, you can take Panadol, um, something like Panadol, um, you know, maybe like a hot water bottle or something, you know, on your stomach. Um, also having like peppermint tea can help soothe your stomach and just staying well hydrated if you do end up having diarrhea or vomiting. So things like gastrolite, 
um, or hydrolyte can be really good to help restore the fluids you lose. Um, and just taking it easy and resting. Um, there's not a lot you can do, unfortunately. It's more manage the symptoms as they occur. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Yeah, really good to know, Shari. It's been some, uh, yeah, some really useful tips that you've given our listeners today. So we do really appreciate it. Um, we're going to put a link to, to your website, to your Instagram, which has some awesome information, some really cool resources in the show notes. Um, so please go and check out Shari, the Syriac Dietitian. Um, apart from obviously yourself and your wealth of knowledge, Shari, what other you know areas? Where, do, where can people go for, for resources um, around celiac disease and around eating gluten free? Yeah, so um, I guess the key body in Australia is Celiac Australia. So we encourage everyone who has celiac disease to join up and become a member. They have some great resources. Um, you know, for each capital city, they've got lists of restaurants that have been accredited by Celiac Australia. Um, so, you know, people who have celiac disease and even people um, like um, your partner can, like, yeah, refer to the list and go to a restaurant knowing that they're safe. Um, I think, is it the Happy Celiac? I'm not sure if they have a list of restaurants too. Um, so the Happy Celiac is another website um, that has a lot of information on, you know, eating out, traveling. Um, they also provide like, <laughs> not that we can do it at the moment, um, traveling overseas. Yeah. So they actually have cards that translate and say, hi, like I have celiac disease, explain it and say what will happen, you know. Um, so there's the, yeah, the Happy Celiac um, website, the Celiac Australia website and getting the membership is really, um, yeah, beneficial. There's so many, like I said, resources. Um, another one is the Celiac Australia app. It's a phone app and you can actually use it. It has an ingredients list and it has a additives list. And basically you can type in whatever ingredient you want and see if it's got gluten in it. Um, so that can be helpful when, you know, trying to read a label. Um, and then also um, uh, with hazards on um, social media. So, you know, following a dietitian like myself. Um, so, you know, someone who's providing evidence-based information and also the celiac community on Instagram is massive and they're so, you know, supportive to one, uh, one another and supportive of each other. Um, you know, there's all these accounts that list, you know, good restaurants, you know, tips and different foods, you know, to make at home, meal ideas, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I'd probably say Celiac Australia, the happy celiac um, social media, no, yeah, no, any like random Joe Blow. Um, yeah. That's awesome. That's so cool to know. And I think, I mean, I can imagine traveling overseas, especially for, for celiacs will be very, very difficult. It's, uh, it sucks that we can't do that at the moment, but hopefully we can, we can sooner rather than later. Um, yeah. Then having, yeah, some sort of resource when, resource when you're traveling, at least to translate and make sure you can ask the right questions will be, uh, will be super valuable. So, um, yeah, that's really cool to know, Shari. We'll whack some of those links up in our show notes as well. Um, yeah. Lastly, just to finish, now, tomato sauce is a staple in most people's houses. Um, yeah. And tomato sauce in general is gluten-free, right? Or is there some that does contain gluten? Um, so generally, like, it's, it's always hard because different brands have different, you know, additives. Gen yep. Generally, I think the one that we have, is it Master Foods? I think it's gluten-free i would always like always read the label um yeah um sorry always double check always read the label as we know yeah. um but yeah. just touching on that shari the most important question that this is want to know from you um from this chat is where do you keep the tomato sauce is it in the fridge or is it in the pantry <laughs> i um i listened to yes um uh this question before and now I kind of wish um who is it James was here James yeah. <laughs> um 
So I keep it in the fridge. <laughs> oh, no, Shari, no. I know, you keep it in the pantry, don't you? <laughs> really, where it's supposed to be. Oh. Doesn't yeah. it say, I should know this, doesn't it say keep refrigerated once opened? Like... <laughs> It, it, it actually does, and it's 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 always possible that it, how every tomato sauce manufacturer is actually wrong. Um, <laughs> always puzzled me why? Why do you keep it in the fridge, show? Why? Well, because if I'm eating something hot, I want that coolness, like you know. <laughs> I um. Yeah, respect for you, Shari, and now I've got a little bit less, but that's okay. <laughs> it's hard to keep it even oh no! Even if it's new Sorry. And you're entitled to your opinion, even if your opinion's wrong, Shari. <laughs> okay, Chris. <laughs> um, no, but in all seriousness, thanks so much uh, for coming on and chewing the fat with, with me today. Um, it's been brilliant. And yeah, for people who do have an intolerance or, or are celiacs, I think, yeah, these sort of conversations, this sort of information that you've given us um, is so, so valuable. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people are really gonna, gonna enjoy it. So um, yeah, I know that I've, I've learned a lot and it's really opened my eyes to a few things. So yeah, thank you so much for, for coming on today, Shari. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you. No worries. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Um, and yeah, just being able to help spread the word about celiac disease. Um, it's just so important, you know, 80% um, of people don't know they have it. So if I can, you know, share a little bit of information that, you know, triggers someone to be like, I'm going to go, you know, get this checked out and yeah, um, looked at. Yeah. It, yeah. Makes a makes me feel yeah really good so absolutely well you're doing some great work shari so thanks again <laughs> thank you chris bye